Hi everyone, my name is Jack Neal and welcome back to my YouTube channel, where we cover all things horrifying and morbid. In today's video, we're talking about three cannibals that you have not heard of, and the cases gradually get more disturbing. If you haven't already, make sure to murder that like button and we'll get right into the video. But don't forget, look behind you. It's 1984 in a small town in Brazil called Garahun. Jorge Negromonte and his wife Isabel want nothing more but to have a child and start a family, but they can't. See, when Jorge was a young boy, he was sent off by his parents to live with his aunt, far away from his two brothers and mom and dad. He's never really felt the true connection of a family, so Isabel's inability to give him a child sends him down a dark path of resentment, loneliness, and anger. And when Jorge gets angry, his outburst becomes so severe that eventually he's taken to the doctor's office and they diagnose him with schizophrenia. He's prescribed medication to treat the disorder, but sometimes Jorge doesn't take it. And when he doesn't take it, bad things happen. A few years pass by and after countless attempts at having a child and not succeeding, Jorge decides to take matters into his own hands. He then meets a young girl, Bruna Oliveira, who he describes as a captivatingly beautiful brunette. However, she's just a teenager. Jorge's 34 and she is 16. It's almost more conceivable that she would be the daughter that he never had, but regardless, she becomes Jorge's mistress. Bruna eventually moves in with the couple, starts living in their home, and Isabel seemingly doesn't mind. And as Bruna's been living with them for some time, she begins to realize that Jorge is a completely different guy when he's not taking his medication. She begins telling him about her interest in Satanism and eventually reveals to him that she herself is a witch. Together, they start learning about black magic, Wicca, and the occult, and together form their own secret sect or branch of Satanism. Meanwhile, Jorge still has a deep desire to have children and begins growing envious of his neighbors, whom he thinks in his mind do not deserve kids because they'll grow up to be nothing more than low-life criminals who serve no purpose other than polluting the world. This deep-rooted jealousy, combined with their interest in black magic, causes Jorge, Isabel, and Bruna to conjure up a plan for revenge. They find it imperative, almost necessary, that they kill the women of the world that God would deem as worthless trash. The only problem, however, is that this sin violates the seventh commandment, thou shall not kill. They consider this briefly, but eventually come to the conclusion the only way God will forgive me for this is if I purify myself. And how do they purify themselves? Eating the body. Maybe not the solution that I would have went with, but in 2011, Bruna and Isabel go out into town to look for female victims. While on their hunt, they stumble across a 17-year-old teenage mom named Jessica. She's just had a newborn baby, but she's broke, desperate, and hungry. Isabel and Bruna start having a conversation with her, and they seem quite trustworthy. On the outside looking in, they appear to be mom and daughter, nice, looking to help out a young, struggling teenage mom. And after a few minutes more talking, they eventually offer Jessica to get paid in exchange for helping around the house. The three then head toward the Negromonte home, where the teen mom starts doing odd jobs around the house for about three months until January 2012. It's just like any other day. Jessica arrives at the trio's home to do some chores around the house, and she's holding her baby in her arms, having a conversation with Bruna, and all of a sudden, Jorge comes up from behind her. He takes a giant machete and stabs Jessica in the neck. She then collapses, holding her child in her arms and dies before she hits the ground. A month later, 21-year-old Gazelle Da Silva is lured to the home and experiences a similar fate. Bruna and Isabel invite her over to talk about their devotion to God, but things don't exactly work out that way. The third and final killing occurs 30 days later when the girls lure Alexandra De Silva to the household claiming they need a babysitter to watch over their child. In reality, this is the child of Jessica, the teen mom, but regardless, 20-year-old Alexandra is interested in the position, so she travels to the family home where her life is taken in a very similar fashion. They proceed to take all of her possessions, including her credit cards, and that's when Bruna makes a crucial mistake. She 
she uses the credit card at a nearby store. Yes, the credit card of a missing woman. Police track her down, find her, and take her into questioning. When she's arrested, not only does she admit to killing the babysitter they tried to hire, Alexandra, but also Gazelle, the woman they found off the street, and the first victim, Jessica. And she then goes on to explain that it's very unlikely the officers will be able to find these bodies because, well, they had been cooking them into meat pies and selling them around the neighborhood for the community to enjoy. Police immediately call in a raid to the home of Jorge Negromonte and find him, a bag of bones, and a 50-page manifesto entitled Revelations of a Schizophrenic. This book outlines the murders, the methods, and the trio's insatiable needs to eat human flesh. This haunting manuscript serves as a black and white confession to one of the grisliest crimes Brazil has ever seen. And when the story gets out, not only are people in the local community feeling disgusted about the horrors that went on in the Negromonte home, but also they're feeling physically ill because those meat pies were extremely popular and sold all over town. Everyone in the town is left wondering, did I eat human meat? Most notably, the chief of police leading the investigation comes forward admitting that he had in fact purchased the empanadas or meat filled pies and they were so good in fact that he ordered them several times. Jorge is then dubbed the real life Sweeney Todd. And if you're not familiar, it's a famous musical based around the character Sweeney Todd, a barber who would murder his customers with a straight razor and give their bodies to his partner who would bake them into, you guessed it, meat pies. Two years later, in 2014, the trial begins, and while people find the heinous details of the case to be quite disturbing, they are left feeling even more uncomfortable by the behavior of the defendants. Jorge and Bruna are often seen smiling in court, growing more and more affectionate with one another with each gruesome detail. They seem happy, almost euphoric, when the court starts talking about the trio turning people into pies, but this attitude quickly changes when the verdict is released. Jorge Negromonte is convicted on two counts of murder, concealment, and vilification of a corpse and is given 71 years in prison. Isabel is given a slightly less severe sentence at 68 years and Bruna is given 71 years and 10 months. Now you're probably left wondering how does Bruna get a less severe sentence than him? Well, when he testifies in court, he frames the story as though he himself is the victim. He recounts that Bruna had been taking advantage of him when he was off his medication, manipulating him at his most vulnerable moments. Jorge is now spending the remainder of his life in prison, and so far has a fairly clean track record. However, he often jokes that he'd like to work in the kitchen as a cook, but the other prisoners, and I'm sure the families of the victims, don't find this too funny. It's a quiet night in the south of Wales when police get a disturbing call. A hotel owner named Mandy Miles tells the cops that she hears a strange noise coming from upstairs, and when they arrive, they break into the room to see a lifeless body laid out on the ground with a man standing over it. There's red liquid dripping from his mouth, and as they try to get a better look at the victim's face, they can't. There's nothing left to look at. It's November 2014 and Matthew Williams has just been released from jail and is looking for a place to stay. Lucky for him, there's a hotel nearby that offers affordable rent to ex-convicts and after a few days he begins to settle in enjoying his newly found freedom. That is until the voices come back. Rewind 10 years earlier. Matthew is diagnosed with schizophrenia. But in this case, the illness isn't brought on naturally. The voices in Matthew's head and the hallucinations he experiences are a result of lifetime substance abuse. Pretty much all his life, Matthew's been using drugs and violence as a coping mechanism, a way to deal with the stress. Now, at 34 years old, he has a pretty lengthy criminal record with over 50 adult and juvenile sentences, ranging anywhere from petty theft to violent crime. Because of his dark criminal past, Matthew has a difficult time getting the medication he needs for his illness because doctors fear that he'll abuse whatever drugs they give him. Another issue he faces is that many doctors who treat mental health disorders don't even recognize schizophrenia, arguing the symptoms don't occur unless the individual uses weed or amphetamines, the two drugs that Matthew uses the most. 
And despite him exhibiting concerning, almost morbid behavior, doctors simply say that he's fine. Each night, he makes several calls to his mom. He tells her the voices in his head won't let him sleep and that he sees faces in the reflections of soda cans. He feels extremely paranoid and is suspicious that someone is following him. This keeps getting worse until one night, a few weeks later, Matthew invites a guest over, a young woman named Sarah Sien. The two had met just recently, and this is the first time they're meeting up with each other, and as Saris heads upstairs to Matthew's room, the other guests in the hotel take notice. Honestly, they're happy for him. It's nice to see Matthew having a guest over because this usually isn't the case. A few hours later, a report is made to the manager of the hotel, Mandy Miles, claiming that there are strange noises coming from Matthew's room. Mandy then heads upstairs to the room, and as she grows closer, she can tell that something's wrong. There's scuffing, things bumping into each other, some yelling, it sounds as though someone is struggling, and then nothing. Mandy knocks on the door and asks Matthew to come out into the hallway, but there's no answer. She repeats herself a few more times, but still nothing but silence. At this point, Mandy's getting impatient. She goes downstairs, grabs the keys to Matthew's room, unlocks the door, walks inside, and stumbles upon something quite disturbing. Matthew is standing over a young woman's body. Mandy doesn't have time to get a good look, but from what she can tell, the woman's face is missing and there are tiny stab wounds all over her body. Matthew is holding a screwdriver, chewing on something, when Mandy yells out to him, Matthew, what are you doing? Matthew doesn't respond. In fact, he barely even notices her. Wanting to protect the other guests at the hotel, Mandy slams the door shut and calls the police and tells them that Matthew does not look human. With his jet black eyes and the blood dripping from his face, he almost looks alien, like Darth Maul or something. 14 minutes later, the police arrive and go upstairs to arrest Matthew. Initially, he resists the arrest, and being that they were terrified of this man or thing that ate a person's face, one of the officers tases Matthew in the stomach to stop him from rushing the door. But this is not enough. He keeps moving forward, so another officer shoots Matthew with his stun gun right between his eyes, and another officer shoots his taser, and in total it takes all four police to bring Matthew down. And when he goes down, he doesn't get back up. In an interview following the gruesome scene, one of the officers says to a reporter, Saying I feared for my safety is just police jargon. I was absolutely breaking it. We've been told that he'd been eating someone, and I didn't want him to take a chunk out of me. It's April 16th, 1874. The snow is beginning to melt after an unusually harsh winter, and the employees of the Los Pinos Indian Agency are enjoying a warm meal in the cafeteria. All of a sudden, a man stumbles in, claiming he was abandoned by his friends in the Colorado wilderness. It's completely believable. He looks dirty, exhausted, and overall disheveled. He begs the employees for some food, or at least just a little bit of water, and eventually they give it to him, completely unaware that his stomach is full of human flesh. The men of the Indian agency don't realize that they just saved the life of Alfred Packer, the Colorado cannibal. Six months earlier, a group of 20 men leave their jobs in Utah after they hear news of a gold rush in Breckenridge, Colorado. The group plans to hike hundreds of miles through harsh, mountainous terrain, but 25 miles into their journey, they come across a man named Alfred Packer. They find Alfred alone in a forest in Utah, and he begs them to join the group, claiming that he's an accomplished mountain guide and prospector. Eventually, they allow it, but it doesn't take long for some of the men to regret their decision. Alfred does not know the area well, and he suffers from frequent seizures, slowing the hikers down. No one in the group particularly likes Alfred, and in the weeks that follow, he's constantly being accused of lying, cheating, and stealing. But Alfred isn't the only reason the group is doing poorly. The weather's worse than anyone could have expected, and they're almost out of their rations. Luckily though, they find a Native American camp nearby, and the chief invites them to stay while the men wait out the storm. They more than happily accept, and while they're grateful to the Native Americans, they're very reluctant to overstay their welcome. Two months pass by, and in February 1874, the members of the group are becoming more and more restless. It doesn't look like the snow is letting up anytime soon, so 11 of the 20 men decide to split up into two groups. 
groups. There's a group of five that's led by a man named Oliver Lutzenheiser, and he takes the advice of the tribe's chief, who tells them to follow the river until they reach town. Alfred, on the other hand, leads his group of six men up into the San Juan Mountains, which, while being more dangerous, are, in his words, much faster. Alfred tells his men that they'll be in their destination in no time, and they have more than enough food to last the two-week journey. Two full months pass by, and that's when Alfred stumbles into the Los Pinos Indian Agency, completely and totally alone, with everyone in his party dead. The employees of the agency listen to Alfred as he tells his story while he's wolfing down food and drinks. He tells them that he was left alone in the wilderness for several weeks, left only to survive on tree roots and rosebuds. As the employees listen, they can't help but notice that Alfred is a little bloated. He hardly looks like a man who's been starving, but regardless, they have no reason not to trust him, so they offer him a place to stay. Ten days later, Alfred sells his rifle to one of the workers at the agency for $10 and sets out to a nearby town. And once he arrives, he starts to get comfortable. Alfred books himself a room at the saloon and then goes on an absolute shopping spree at the general store. He buys food, new clothes, and even a horse. Every night before bed, Alfred gets several rounds of drinks at the bar and tells people about his harrowing tale through the Colorado wilderness. It doesn't take long though for the townsfolk to start talking. People notice various inconsistencies and small holes in Alfred's stories, and they don't understand how he's spending all this money when he claims that he's broke. Based on what he's told them, he should only have $10 in his pocket from selling his rifle, but he's managed to spend hundreds of dollars in the past few days. Either way though, Alfred doesn't mind the gossip. He has a warm bed to sleep on, good food, and all the luxuries that he can afford. Life is good until one night he runs into some men from the original group of hikers. These guys are clearly tired, just on the brink of starvation, and when they see Alfred, they become suspicious. They ask him where his men are, and Alfred proceeds to tell him the same story that he's been telling everyone. The men become furious, claiming that he has done something evil. Meanwhile, back at the agency, Oliver Lutzenheiser and his men have finally made it out of the forest. The workers at the agency welcome Oliver, telling them that they had just hosted someone from his group, a man named Alfred Packer. Oliver is skeptical, and after hearing the agency men tell Alfred's story, he warns them that he's up to something nefarious, and immediately advises them to bring him in for questioning. Meanwhile, back in town, Alfred tries to leave the saloon, but the men from his original hiking group won't let him. They say they know Alfred is behind his party's disappearance, and they're willing to take the law into their own hands if they have to. One of the men then threatens to hang Alfred himself, but lucky for him, he's saved by the agency officer who had come to bring him in for questioning. When he arrives, Alfred's met by a series of questions, and after a while, it is clear that he's not telling the truth. As the men discuss what they're going to do with Alfred, two Native Americans storm in, holding up a strip of meat. They say that they found it in the woods while they were hunting, and it is no animal meat. It is white man's meat. And as soon as Alfred hears this, he faints. By the time he comes to, he's totally delirious. He begs the men for forgiveness, promising to tell them everything, and Oliver and the agency men are skeptical. Alfred goes on to explain that each of the men in his party died one at a time, all of natural causes. And when each member died, the remaining men agreed to eat him, loot him, and split the wealth amongst themselves. Eventually though, it was just down to Alfred and one other person. Alfred claims that he didn't want to hurt the other survivor, but he had to after the other man attacked him first. No one in the agency believes this, but they're willing to treat Alfred as innocent until proven guilty. The head of the agency then makes Alfred an offer. If he's willing to lead a group of men into the forest to confirm where the bodies are, the head of the agency might be willing to accept Alfred's story. Alfred isn't thrilled to head back into the woods, but he realizes there's no other choice. He, a few agency men, and Oliver Lutzenheiser proceed to hike back into the Colorado wilderness. In the weeks that follow, the search comes up short. To no one's surprise, Alfred isn't able to prove any of the bodies are where he said they'd be, so... He becomes desperate. In a few days time, he'll be arrested, so he decides to make a break for it. During a quiet moment, Alfred takes a look around, it's just him and one other officer. 
He slowly approaches the officer, then reaches for a blade that he has concealed in his jacket, takes out the knife, and strikes. But he's no match for the agency officer, who quickly disarms Alfred and overpowers him. It doesn't take long for the others to return, and the Los Pinos agency men finally have the evidence they need to arrest Alfred Packer. In the end, there's only one common thread in his stories that people actually believe. He said in the past that by the time he'd gotten out of the woods, he'd grown quite fond of human meat. He even admits that the hardest part of his journey was having to cast aside his human meat rations before stumbling through those cafeteria doors. <laughs>